thing every lecture, and every lecture will be posted uh, on the course website uh, under the, on the calendar for that day. And uh, so you'll be able to go back and review the lecture if you missed it, or uh, if if uh, if there's something you want to go back and see again. Um, so you'll be able to miss two sections without penalty, two lab sections without penalty. Um, you will not be able to make up missed lab sessions without severely extending circumstances and the instructor's, ad uh, instructor's advanced permission. Software. The recommended software for this course is Firefox with Firebug. Um, and your text editor of choice, if you don't have a text editor of choice, we can recommend TextPad for Windows. There's also Notepad++ for Windows is also a good one. Um, Smoltron is a good one for Mac. I think a lot of people like to, to do other uh, editors as well. I use one called TextMate. Um, some people like to use uh, uh, Dreamweaver. Um, Dreamweaver has a, actually a pretty good code editor. Problem with Dreamweaver is that if you do use Dreamweaver, you're not allowed to use the sort of WYSIWYG design tools. WYSIWYG meaning what you see is what you get. So you're not allowed to use the design tools um, portion of Dreamweaver. You're not allowed to use front page, you're not allowed to use any of those programs that generate HTML and CSS code for you, uh, because that's the entire goal of the, of the course, is to learn to do that yourself. So that just defeats the purpose. So, yeah. So why Firefox? That's a good question. That's the next thing I wanted to talk about. So we recommend Firefox. Uh, obviously, uh, many of you uh, probably don't prefer Firefox as your browser of choice, <laughs> me included. Personally, I, Firefox is just too old and clunky for me. Um, but there are, there are three very good reasons why we recommend using Firefox. First of, all, first of all, I recommend using Firefox for developments, partly because of Firebug. Anybody heard of Firebug? Firebug is a, an add-on in Firefox that allows you to inspect the contents of the page and do sort of debugging related things. Um, it's a very useful tool to allow you to see what's going on in the browser. Um, how the browser is parsing stuff, what CSS rules are being applied, what Ajax requests are being made, uh, a lot of, of really useful information. Um, <clears throat> there are equivalent tools in both Chrome and Internet Explorer and Safari, and I, I, I would assume there's one in Opera, although I've never seen it. Um, but in my experience, Firebug is not the not the prettiest, but it's the easiest to use, especially for an intro student. So if you would like to use Chrome and you'd like to use Chrome's built-in developer tools, um, do it at your own risk. Uh, because we have to standardize on one browser, on one platform, we will be standardizing on Firefox. Um, so those are, those are the two main reasons why you want to use Firefox. One, it, uh, it uses Firebug. And I, I believe Firebug is the best uh, debugging tool. Two, for that reason, we will be grading your assignments in Firefox. So that's a, a really good reason for you to, to be using Firefox. Three, possibly the most important, although um, uh, it might not seem like it right now, it's a good idea to get in the habit of using Firefox if you're going to be a professional web developer. Professional web developers have to design for uh, compatibility across multiple browsers, multiple platforms. And if you use the fact that Chrome, Chrome is objectively the best browser available, which specifically precludes it from being a good browser to develop in. It's, it's unfortunate, but that's really just the case. Firefox is behind, and that, that's precisely what makes Firefox the, Firefox the best browser to develop in because it doesn't support all the standard bells, all the bells and whistles, the, the new fancy features that, that Chrome does, um, you will be able to catch errors sooner. Um, so it's a good idea if you want to be a professional web developer to st start getting the habit of using kind of, not the best browser, but a little bit, little bit uh, behind browser. And currently that, that browser is Firefox. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say you should develop an IE, but... Um, <laughs> But Firefox is a good middle-of-the-road browser, allows you to catch some things that, that might not be supported in all browsers um, and, and uh, adjust accordingly. So Firefox is a good thing to, as a professional, learn to develop in. <clears throat> yeah? Is Voltron uh, free to download? 
I, you know, I thought it was actually. This might be out of date. I, I, I think it might actually cost money now. Does anybody know? Um, I'm not sure about Smoltron, but uh, I know for a fact that like Notepad, Notepad plus plus Sublime text editor, um, those are both free. And so in like what we did, of course, last quarter when I took it, I use Sublime. Uh, Marty uses. Uh, well, he uses some weird things. He uses something on Linux, yeah, right? Yeah, he uses some some weird stuff. But yeah, you can use a. Uh, Sublime or Notepad plus plus, and that's those are free options that you okay. can download here. Okay, so Sublime is is free. Excellent. Yeah. Sublime is five dollars. It's five dollars. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, there are other options that are available for free. Um, if if uh, five bucks is uh, is too dear, I, I I can give you a list of those, uh, though I don't have them off the top of my head right now. Uh, the one that I use is it's not free. It's it's called uh, Text TextMate. Um, it's kind of an old school, it, it, it used to be the state of the art, now it's kind of falling behind, but I like it. Um, but th there are lots of text editors out there. F feel free to ask myself or your TA for a recommendation if you like. Um, okay, uh, in addition to uh, uh, the web browser and, uh, <clears throat> and a text editor, uh, you just need to have a, an FTP program that's capable of SFTP, secure FTP. Um, on the lab machines you're going to be using, it's going to be called WinSCP, I believe. So that's one that you can download on Windows, WinSCP. Um, on the Mac, I use Transmit, but there's also like Fugu and um, uh, what else is there? Fetch. I don't know. I, I don't remember which ones are. I think Fugu is free, right? That's the FileZilla. FileZilla is also cross browser uh, or cross platform. That's uh, that's also free. So yeah, if, if you need recommendations, uh, just let us know. <clears throat> Grading for the course. Uh, this is something new since I've taught the course. Last time I taught this course was uh, two summers ago. Um, and at that time, it wasn't a permanent course. Since it be has become a permanent course, I believe they've, uh, they've gone to grading majors and non-majors differently. Um, how many majors do we have in this, in this uh, class, CSC majors? OK. I believe I'm going to have to grade you guys differently. So this, this specifies how you will be graded. Um, so these are the weights for everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to change the final exam there. Um, that's obviously wrong. Um, for non-majors, your percentage will be mapped to the 4.0 scale roughly uh, according to this table. For majors, no minimum grade is promised, but overall grades will be curved to ensure a reasonable average and median course grade overall, likely in the 3.2 to 3.4 range. So as you might expect from this department, they're making it a little bit more difficult for you guys. Um, if you uh, don't show up to the final exam, of which there will be one, I'll talk about that in a sec, then I reserve the right to just fail you completely. Um, <clears throat> homework and lateness policy. Homework consists of weekly individual programming assignments uh, that will be submitted electronically from the course website. Programs are graded on external correctness and internal correctness. Anybody who has taken 142 or 143 here is familiar with those terms. External correctness is the working behavior of your program. Does it do what it's supposed to do? Um, the internal correctness is stylistic issues, stylistic concerns like did you name your functions appropriately and intuitively and variable names and did you use too many global? Uh, did you use inappropriate global variables? Did you um, uh, did you pass function pass parameters appropriately and use return values appropriately? Is your program a good summary of the? Uh, 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 is your like, main function or your program a good summary of, of what your, your program does? Um, did you comment your, your code appropriately? All of these things are things that we'll be talking about uh, in lecture and in section. Stylistic issues that you'll uh, be expected to, uh, uh, to, to incorporate into your, your own best practices. Um, and, and your homework assignments should, should reflect um, uh, good stylistic choices. So you'll be graded on internal correctness for style. Um, if you have a dispute about your grade, please don't wait until the end of the quarter. You must uh, dispute it within two weeks of receiving the grade. Uh, we do make mistakes. That's fine. Uh, programming assignments must be turned in uh, online using the online submission system um, on the course website. They will not be accepted by email, FTP, instant message, or posting them on the web server. You have to submit them online. For this course, there are two ways that you submit a homework assignment. You have to do both of them. First, you have to submit it via the submission tool, the online submission tool. Second, you have to upload it to our course web server. Our 
course web server is a web space that is allocated for you on a web server that's called webster.cs.washington.edu. That is a computer that's set up specifically to host your programs, host your code. That's a, a space that you connect to, you upload your files to, and then in your web browser you view your files, um, just like on a professional website. So this is a, a space that's allocated for you to put your stuff for this course. Um, so you will have to upload your, your, your stuff to the course web server, as well as submit via the online submission tool. Those bo both of those things will be required for every homework assignment. Uh, it'll give you a receipt after you turn it in. We strongly recommend that you save your receipt. That proves that you submitted your uh, files. If we happen to lose them for some reason, that is proof that you submitted your files. You receive five free late days, just like uh, usual CSE homework assignments. Five free late days um, that you can use throughout the quarter. If you want to turn something in one or two days late, then you uh, use one or two of your, your late days. And uh, after you've used up all your late days, then you start getting docked points. Um, each successive day will be worth one point after you've used up your five free late days. Uh, regardless of how many late days you have, you may not submit a program more than three days after it is due or after the last day of class. So the last day of class is the cutoff for everything. Did I see a hand over here? No. Uh, you will not be granted extensions without highly extenuating circumstances. Exams. There is no uh, midterm exam. But there is a final exam for this course. Um, <clears throat> our open book for the, uh, the textbook, but they are closed book for anything else, all other books and notes. You can use the textbook, but nothing else. Not handouts, not printed assignment solutions, not other written materials, not computing devices, none of that, uh, the textbook only. <clears throat> Makeup exams will not be given in case of a, uh, except in case of a serious emergency. Um, if, you, if you have any extenuating circumstances at all, email me. Um, chances are, uh, it, I mean, it's going to have to be a severe emergency in order for you to miss the exam. Yeah? Uh, when it comes to homeworks, uh, is the most grade dropped? No, all homework assignment uh, grades are kept. Labs are dropped, uh, two labs are dropped, and uh, you'll be able to, to miss a couple of sections uh, without it affecting your grade, but all homework assignments, um, all homework assignments count. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all homework assignments are going to be worth 20 points, and I think we're going to have eight of them. Um, and then uh, labs are going to be worth 15% um, of your grade, I think it says. So 15% of your grade is lab and section participation. Um, so 65% of, of your grade is those, uh, those, uh, those eight, eight-ish homework assignments. Right, um, we're going to be splitting the final across the last two days, I believe. Um, the lab and the lecture. Um, I haven't, uh, that's what we did last time, and, I, and that worked out well. So I, I, I believe we're going to do the same thing this time. <coughs> that's, a, that's a good point, yeah. So the, the final exam during summer quarter is typically the last day, but it will be a, a traditional two hour uh, final that'll be split across the last Thursday and the last Friday. Okay, collaboration policy. Programming assignments must be completed individually, so you must do your own work for this course, just like any other CSE course. Has anybody taken a, a CSE course here at, uh, at UW? Okay, excellent. Um, most of you are familiar with the, the collaboration policy then for, uh, for other courses. This course is uh, the same. Um, labs and sections are very highly collaborative. You can exchange solutions and just you know talk talk about uh, uh, whatever you need to in order to get uh, in order to get your work done. But homework assignments are to be done completely on your own. Um, you can talk to each other about concepts, uh, but there's sort of a line that you can't cross uh, with regards to uh, doing your own work uh, in this course. And it's a difficult line to define. Um, but in general, you should abide by the following. You may not work as a partner with any other student on an assignment. 
You may not show another student your solution to an assignment or look at anyone other's solution. You may not have another person walk you through the assignment. So like, for example, I, in the past students have said, well, you know, I can't see their code, but, but, but what are you doing on line three? Oh, OK. OK, what are you doing on line four? Oh, OK. You know, that, that obviously doesn't work either. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's the same as if you're causing somebody else or somebody else is causing you to, um, to not do their own work or to not you do your own work, then you're violating the course collaboration policy. You may not post your homework solutions on a publicly accessible, i.e. non-password protected website. Uh, toward the end of the quarter, we'll give you instructions about how to safely post your, your solutions um, on a website. Uh, but for the duration of this quarter, you'll be posting them on our course web server where your material is automatically protected. So you won't have to worry about that until the end of the quarter, as long as you only uh, upload your work to our course web, our, our website. <coughs> um, if you give inappropriate help, you're equally as guilty as receiving inappropriate help, so please don't do that. Um, I don't want to harp on about this. Most of you are familiar with how this works, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. But you basically need to do your own work. Uh, and we will enforce this by running uh, programs on, uh, on, your, uh, uh, on your submissions throughout the quarter to see if there are any inappropriate um, similarities. Okay. Any questions on the syllabus? Yeah. Uh, do you know what day of the week they will typically be due on Wednesdays. They will go out on Wednesdays, and they'll be due the, next, the following Wednesday. Um, this week's will go out after this Wednesday's lecture, uh, because we need this Wednesday's lecture in order to do it. But it's a bit shorter. It's a smaller homework assignment, um, and so it's a little bit easier. Um, it, so it'll still be due next Wednesday. Uh, but from that point on, I'll usually post them like Tuesday evening really late, so that they're available all of Wednesday. And they'll be, basically, they're, they're available for a full eight days. Uh, they'll be due late on Wednesdays. Any other questions? <coughs> Excellent. OK. Well, let's get started. <coughs> so um, we're going to start really quickly by uh, doing an overview of the internet and how it works and some of the technologies that are behind the internet in organizations. Um, the internet is uh, a system of interconnected computers. Um, there are lots of systems that, uh, that transmit information uh, from your computer to another computer, but basically it's a lot of computers. Um, and it's sort of a web. I, I like to think of it like the, the, the road infrastructure. There are lots of highway systems, and those highway systems are freeway systems, large freeway systems, fat pipes that, that trans, transport lots of cars. And then if you need to get closer to somewhere, you might get off on a smaller highway. And if you need to get closer to somewhere, you need to uh, get off on a smaller highway and a smaller highway and until you're on a side street, and then you're at your house. right? Um, that's really how the internet works, um, I, I, in, in, a, in a really broad sense. That's, that's kind of how the internet works. Um, there are lots of uh, communication protocols. There are lots of layers involved. I, I don't really want to get into the, uh, um, uh, the model uh, uh, involved in actually transmitting information, but it's, it's really complicated. Um, and uh, it, it's really great. The internet is awesome. So uh, we're just going to move on. Brief history. Um, <clears throat> started in the 60s. Uh, email and uh, in file transfer were some of the, its first uses. Um, oftentimes people uh, believe that the web is synonymous with the internet. That's not the case. Um, how many uh, other services can you think of that use the internet in addition to web browsers? Anyone? Apps on cell phones? Um, yes, sometimes they can use other services. Yeah, uh huh. Can you think of any specifically? Online video games? Yes, they often communicate using different ports than the web port. Yes. SSH and FTP. SSH, and FTP. SSH is uh, a way for you to uh, get a terminal session on another on a remote computer. Um, FTP. Email is one of the big ones. Um, email is really huge. Um, you might use a web browser to visit gmail.com or something, but then when you type in your email 
uh, on that web page and you hit send, um, what, what the web browser does is it communicates with the Gmail server. The Gmail server then packages up that email and sends it behind the scenes across the internet via a different service than the web. So that, that gmail.com server is, uh, is serving two uses. It's being a server for a web browser and it's also being a server for email. Um, anybody think of another one, like a big one? There's, there's another one I'm trying to get at. How about video chat, Skype? Skype is something that, 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 that communicates across the internet and, and is completely separate from the web. So that's a, a, another, <coughs> another big uh, user of the web. Amazon.com opened in 95. Let's see. The web was created by Sir Tim Berners-Lee in 89 to 91. It was initially uh, just, it was based on just hypertext. You click on a link to get more information about that piece of information. Um, uh, and it just, it grew and blossomed from there. And of course, one of the most useful things ever to come from the internet Um, that's, that's one of the first memes, actually. That's like really like one of the first ones. Um, <clears throat> okay, key aspects of the internet. Sub networks can stand on their own. If, uh, if a portion of the internet goes out, um, if, uh, if, if the connection to a portion uh, that, uh, that, that network is somehow severed, um, everything else stands on its own. It's highly redundant. Everything else um, just still works. Um, computers can dynamically join and leave the network. When you uh, close a computer and you go home and you open up your computer again, you are connecting to the internet from a different place. Uh, you've left it and then you've gone to somewhere else and you've joined it again. It's built on open standards. Anybody can uh, create a new internet device. Anybody can create something that uses the internet. Um, it's, uh, it's been developed and revised and revised and developed um, over the course of 30 something years. Um, and it's to the point where everything is, is um, <clears throat> everything is documented, everything is public, everything is 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 free and open about the internet, um, about the internet itself, it, which is one of the one of the reasons why it, it it gained such popularity. It was really easy to 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 create new devices uh, that work on the internet. Um, let's see. Organizations, IETF is responsible for standards. Uh, ICANN is responsible for TLDs and uh, uh, domain names, things like that. They sub sub license to like GoDaddy and uh, network solutions and stuff. The ability to register domains, but they're the ones in ultimate control of domain names. Uh, W3C is the major uh, group that's responsible for doing what we're going to be talking about this quarter. Uh, which is the web standards. <clears throat> IP, I don't really want to talk about IP all that much, but uh, in order to be on the internet, you have to have an IP address. This is a, a number. Um, oftentimes you see it in this form, the decimal form of uh, four numbers. Yeah? Uh, I can, or these, these organizations? Sure. Um, well, initially, uh, as was the case, I guess you could say for of all of these organizations, there were lots of people who were at the forefront in academia and research, um, and they just sort of collaborated, um, sort of de facto, um, in the earlier days of the internet. And as as that grew, and um, um, as it, as they developed it more and more over time, they started to formalize their association with each other. So there were people who were just developing things. They were just like, okay, how can we make this better? How can we make this better? And they were just creating new, uh, new things for the internet, um, mostly in research and academia. And you know, over time, they just decided, well, we need to formalize this in some way. We need to form an organization. And uh, they just became the de facto leaders. So that's a good question. <clears throat> in order to connect to the internet, you have to have what's called an IP address. When you open up your computer, your computer sends a, 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 quest, a request to uh, the local network says, please give me an IP address. It gives you an IP address. And from that point, uh, you can communicate across the internet. Um, I don't really want to talk about this any more than, uh, than that. But you can figure out your IP address if you need to. TCP uh, is what allows multiple things to use the internet, multiple uh, uh, services to use the internet. 
So the web is one service that uses the internet, communicates on uh, port 80. Uh, email communicates on port 25. SSH communicates on port 22. And uh, other, other programs use different ports. Um, a port, I, I, the, the, it's tough to come up with an analogy for a port, but the best one that I can think of is if, uh, if every computer is a building, skyscraper and in every skyscraper there are services if you by convention if you want to go to uh, the, the web service in that building by convention you have to go to room number 80 at some point somebody just decided okay we'll make this room number 80 and if you want to go to email you go to room number 25 if you go to um, you know SSH you go to room number 22 um, at some point somebody just decided arbitrarily designated these numbers but on every machine, you sort of just assume that you, want, you need to go to port 80 uh, in order to communicate with the web server. <coughs> web servers and browsers. The web involves back and forth communication between your computer and between a server. So when you type in google.com in your web browser's address bar, it communicates with a computer on the other side. There are, lots of, there are a couple of different things that happen in that process. I'll go over a couple of those in a second. But the, the important thing is that your browser is communicating with something that is giving you information. That other computer on the other side is called the server. And uh, oftentimes, you call the browser a client, a client because it's, uh, it's receiving the information. Um, examples of server software, uh, Apache is one of the most common ones. Um, if you have a Linux machine or a Mac, chances are it's, your, it's got Apache just built into it. It just comes with Apache. It's free and open source. All you have to do is turn it on and configure it, um, and you can run a web server on your local machine. Um, if you have Windows, I believe uh, it still comes with IIS, so you can just turn that on, and you have a web server running on your local machine. A browser, um, everybody's familiar with a browser. Uh, some people are uh, may not be. Uh, aware that there are multiple browsers. Um, lots of people just sort of think, oh, you click on the blue E, right? That's, that's the internet. No, uh, there are lots of different web browsers, and uh, web browsers are not all created equally. So um, <clears throat> it's what's responsible for um, providing the user interface uh, when you type in a, 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 an address or a search query. Um, it, it's res responsible with communicating with the appropriate servers to receive the appropriate information. The domain name system is uh, an important part of this. Um, you can't actually contact Google.com. Google.com doesn't exist. It's an alias that points to a particular IP address or possibly a set of IP addresses. Um, so what your browser does is when you type in Google.com, it, it does a lookup. It looks up in a phone book kind of thing that says, what is the IP address of Google.com? And then it contacts the IP address, not the, uh, not the domain name. Domain name is sort of like if you if you put your mom's name in your phone, you don't you don't remember your mom by her phone number, right? You remember her by the alias mom, right? So um, that's that's what DNS system is. It's a phone book. URL URL is an address uh, of a specific resource, of a specific page, specific piece of information, specific data. It's basically a file. Um, it's a description of a file on on some server. Um, what's happening is uh, when I'm loading this URL, what it's going to do is it's going to contact, the web browser is going to contact this host, awbc.com, using this protocol, and it's going to ask for, I guess like this, it's going to ask for this file path right here. Inside of the root directory, I want you to look in the info directory. Inside of the info directory, I want you to look in the read step directory. And inside of that directory, I want you to look at a file called index.html. That's the file I want. Please send it to me. That's all this says. Uh, I'm, I'm asking this computer to give me a file in a particular location. <clears throat> More advanced URLs have uh, extra bells and whistles in them. This one is uh, one that allows you to sort of uh, uh, go down to a portion of the page. If you've given uh, uh, something on the page a particular ID, then you can just sort of make the browser jump down to that, that, uh, that portion of the page. Um, if you need to specify a different port other than the, the, the default 80, 
Um, you don't have to specify 80. The web browser assumes you're going to communicate on port 80. If you need to change that, you can use this. Uh, and if you want to uh, perform, uh, if you want to, uh, to supply information, say you're making a request to a program instead of a file, and you need to supply information to that program so that it knows what information to give you. This is how Google works. You supply information to uh, the google.com search program, google.com slash search. This is a program. Um, and if you uh, need information from it, you supply some information of your own. Uh, this uh, enters the search query, miserable failure, and it says start at, uh, at, at, uh, um, at entry number 10. So it, it, it configures information uh, that I'm sending to that server program. HTTP, um, this is the protocol with which uh, web browsers communicate with a web server. I don't really want to get into this too much right now. We'll talk about this more later in the quarter. But you can uh, pretend that you're a web browser. This is a really interesting thing for you to do if you've, if you've got the time. You can pretend that you're a web browser using this program called Telnet. Um, and if you do an HTTP command, if you issue an HTTP command, you can see it'll just spit out the HTML code that the server returns to you. So you can uh, pretend that you're a browser. It's great. Uh, error codes. Um, I don't want to talk about these either yet. Uh, these, uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk about those later. MIME types, we'll talk about those later too. Let's see. I want to get to some HTML today. So... <clears throat> Uh, we talked briefly about the, uh, the main web languages and technologies, HTML, CSS, PHP, JavaScript. Um, HTML is used for writing web pages and for dictating the structure of the page. This is a paragraph. This is a header. This is a list item. This, is, this whole thing is a, a, a bunch of, of, of list items, so I'm making it a list. Um, those, those kinds of things. You dictate the structure of the page. With CSS code, you make it pretty. Um, so by default, a web page without any CSS looks pretty ugly. Uh, you use CSS code to change the fonts and colors and move this over there and make that thing green and make this this size and uh, have this resizing behavior, things like that. Uh, use CSS to, to adjust the appearance of your page. PHP is a, a server-side program that dynamically generates HTML. I'll talk about that in a little bit. JavaScript is code that runs in the browser. Um, that uh, is able to interact with the page after it's been loaded. So you load the page, then you, load, you uh, execute some JavaScript. The JavaScript is able to inspect elements on the page, change properties of them, completely change the contents of the page if it wants to. Uh, it's very powerful. Uh, Ajax, uh, again, is, is uh, responsible for re uh, retrieving uh, little pieces of information after the page is loaded. Uh, XML allows you to organize data. Um, it's a, um, we will talk about that in a little bit <clears throat> uh, later on this quarter. Uh, SQL is uh, a language that allows you to interact with databases. Um, you issue queries to the database and it gives you results. So those are the, the primary languages and technologies of the web. Um, and I'm going to go on to some HTML basics real quick. <clears throat> For run out of time. So, HTML describes the content and structure of a page. It identifies uh, pieces on the page as a thing and what type of thing it is. Uh, for example, this is a paragraph. In order to indicate that this is a paragraph, I wrap it with tags. Tags uh, uh, called opening tags and closing tags. This is an opening tag and this is a closing tag. The closing tag is the same as an opening tag, it just has a slash. <clears throat> Most white, pa white space is ignored in HTML. It's considered insignificant and it's collapsed into a single space. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, we're going to be using a newer version of HTML called HTML5. It's the latest and greatest version of HTML. This is the structure of an HTML page. It contains two major portions, the head and the body. The head is sort of meta information. It's information about the page, um, maybe the title of the page, um, uh, other related files that the browser should load, like style sheets for like CSS code, uh, JavaScript code. Um, it incorporates a, a bunch of other things um, and, and tells the browser additional information, maybe like keywords and authorship information, stuff like that, it, meta information about the page. 
The body is where you see all the stuff that actually shows up on screen. So if I could just like select all of this stuff here from the top left to the bottom right, um, inside this browser window, that's all stuff in the body. So that's all stuff that shows up there. Um, and then wrapped around that, you have this HTML tag to indicate that it's HTML. And lastly, we have this doc type up here that indicates the type of information that this file contains, which is HTML. <coughs> An HTML file is saved with the .html file extension, typically. Um, page title, uh, this is one of the, the tags that goes into the head of the browser. This is, uh, anybody know where this, well, it's, it, it's, it says where this, this shows up. Um, this shows up right up here, up in this uh, title bar. Um, it also shows up as the, the name of a bookmark. If you bookmark this page, by default, it'll, it'll use the title of that page. Um, that's different from the, uh, the header on the page, the main header that you see on the page. So on this page, for example, I see this as a header that says page title title. But this is different from that, right? So title of the page is different from the main header that you see on the screen. <clears throat> paragraph, paragraph is one of the most basic tags. It just says this is a, all this text is together. It's a paragraph, it's coherent, whatever. Um, and you'll notice that uh, in the code here, I have lots of white space, I have new lines, I have maybe tabs and lots of space characters. And all of that is eliminated when I, uh, when I see that rendered on the screen. Um, white space is, is collapsed into a single space um, in, in HTML. <coughs> headings. Headings are the kinds of things that you see on page, some of which you might associate with the page's quote-unquote title. Um, so uh, an H1, for example, is, is most likely to be the, the, the title-y looking thing on the page. Um, oftentimes this is like the name of the website, this is like the, the uh, the, the major header on the page, and H2 is a slightly smaller header. Maybe this is the, the title of the page. Um, like maybe the H1 is the title of the, of the site. H2 is the title of this particular page within this website. And then maybe H3, you might have subheaders on this page. Um, there are H3s, and so on. Um, these are, are, are nested according to their order of importance. So um, within your H1, you might have several H2s. Um, and uh, each H2 might have several H3s inside of it and so on. <coughs> Horizontal rule, uh, nobody uses this anymore. I don't even want to talk about that. Uh, okay, more about HTML tags. Uh, we've got attributes as well, yeah. Sorry, uh, how far down did the heading numbers go? Heading numbers go to six, one through six, yeah. Uh, it, it will default to something if you don't override it. So we'll talk about CSS in a little bit, how to override the font sizes. What he said is, uh, how do you set the font sizes of, uh, of, of things? Um, well, we'll talk about that when we get to CSS. <coughs> uh, attributes. Some HTML tags have attributes. In fact, every HTML tag can have attributes. Um, one of the most important ones, this is a, a tag, this A tag stands for anchor. It's one of the original terms for a hyperlink. Um, basically, this allows you to make a link. So you click it, and it goes to somewhere else. In order for it to go to somewhere else, you have to specify where it should go. So um, this is an attribute, an additional piece of information for this tag. Um, it goes inside of the opening tag. So the opening tag, you've got a space, and then href um, is, is the name of the attribute. You've got href equals, and then in quotes, the URL that you want to send, send the user to if they click here. <coughs> Uh, right, so that's a link. Uses the href attribute. Each of these results in a link. Um, there are two different types of elements, two main types of elements in, on the page. They're called block and inline elements. A block level element spe is, is, uh, it specifies that this is a, a coherent chunk of content and an inline, it is sort of a container. It, it, uh, a block level element is just a container for, for inline content. An inline element says that this is, uh, this is an element that rests on a line of text. Um, we'll see examples of this. We'll, we'll, we'll look at this a little bit more when we get into CSS. 
<coughs> an image. Uh, image tag is the IMG element. Uh, it takes two attributes, the SRC and the alt. Um, SRC specifies the, the URL of the image to load. And then alt specifies um, an alternative uh, text description of that image. Um, if somebody is unable to consume this, this image visually, um, then they're going to need a, 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 an alternate way to consume this information. And uh, oftentimes that happens in the form of text, which can be read orally um, for the user to be able to consume this information. Uh, I don't want to talk about that. Line breaks. Line breaks should be used sparingly. Um, oftentimes, uh, when people are new to web development, they like to space things out. Um, and in order to space things out, they're like, oh, I'll, I'll put a bunch of line breaks in there. Just like I do in Word, I just like hit return a few times. That's the equivalent of a, of a BR tag, right? So I'll just put like five or six BR tags here to space things further apart. You should never, ever do that. Um, and we'll talk about how to do that uh, when we talk about CSS. CSS is what allows you to move things, space them apart. Uh, BR tag is used when you really need a line break, when a line break is an, an important part of the content. Um, so for example, this is a poem right here, and a poem contains lines, and they have breaks between the lines, and the breaks are important. So a BR tag is used, in, in this case, appropriately. Uh, as a rule of thumb, ne never use more than one line break in a row. Uh, if, if you're doing that, chances are uh, you intend to space things apart, and you should do that using CSS. <clears throat> phrase elements, EM and strong are two of the most common phrase elements. EM is emphasis, and strong is strong emphasis. Um, you might say, well, what is the difference between these and, uh, so like EM, I mean, that, that looks like italic, right? And strong, that looks like bold, right? So is EM italic and is strong bold? I mean, is that what they are? Yes, these are the default appearances. Uh, the, the browser just says, OK, well, if you want to emphasize this, you want to convey emphasis, OK. I'm just going to guess that sort of a, a good way to convey this emphasis is by making it italic. OK, I, I'm just going to make it italic because that's, that's a good way to convey that. Same thing with strong. If you want to make something strongly emphasized, then I'm just, OK, I'll make it bold because that's a little bit more emphasis than italic or something. You can change these. You can change those defaults using CSS. So if you want to emphasize something by, by making it green, or if you want to strongly emphasize something by just increasing the font size or making it all caps or um, by making it blink or something, you can do all of that. You can change the way something is emphasized or strongly emphasized. So EM is not the same as italic, and uh, strong is not the same as bold. Uh, nesting tags. Uh, tags must be properly nested. Um, <clears throat> so this is an example of improper nesting. We have an EM tag that's opened, and then we have a strong tag that's opened, and then we close the EM tag before we close the strong tag. This is wrong. We need to, uh, we need to close the strong tag before we close the EM tag. So uh, for, uh, for CSE majors, you can think of this as a stack. Um, you uh, pop a new uh, opening tag on the stack, you have to close the first one on, on, on the top of the stack. <clears throat> comments. Um, oftentimes, comments are not necessary in uh, HTML files. The only comments that will be required from uh, a view for this course is authorship information. At the top of your file, you should always include information uh, about yourself, about the course, about the purpose of the file, um, maybe the homework assignment that it's for, things like that. Uh, we'll talk more about that, but uh, in HTML, you don't really need to comment like, this is, the, this is the, the about me section, and this is the sidebar section, and this is the whatever section, this is the main content section, because uh, HTML is really self-descriptive. It's sort of, it's, it's obvious, it's self-evident that when you have a div id equals sidebar, that that's the sidebar. So um, the only comments you'll probably need in HTML at the top of your file. Um, and I think we'll leave it with that for today. Um, and we'll continue tomorrow.
uh, on Wednesday. Uh, your sections tomorrow, um, you, you don't have anything due for them. You will have, uh, you will have something to do in section in the following week, but you will still receive participation points for going tomorrow. So please be sure to show up. Yeah.